This is a call to action, and I'm your host, Alex Habersham. And traditionally and regularly, we try to address different topics in the community that will be of utmost significant significance to the community in an effort to provide meaningful information that's going to help to change and affect our lives. Now, one thing that really affects our lives is uh, health, wellness, and access to health care, and understanding the right approach to getting uh, the best health care available. So that way, uh, and because of that, I'm just very, very happy uh, to have with us um, uh, a young man who's a doctor and who's very, very capable and abreast of some of the things that can be done to access health care and, you know, different alternatives. You know, a lot of people don't think about it, Dr. Duke, that there are different approaches to uh, receiving health care. So we're going to talk uh, talk about it uh, today on this show. And meanwhile, before I finish introducing you, you know, I'm a bit concerned because I heard this week that hospitals are either at or approaching capacity. So that kind of bespeaks of the necessity for all of us to be familiar with uh, uh, approaches and avenues to uh, receiving health care because, ha- because, because the hospital is up to capacity. That doesn't mean that our bodies and you know chemistry and what have you are going to wait until it's uh, to the capacity increases. So I think it's important if, in fact, there are alternatives to health care that we've, we've got an expert with us this morning to talk about. It. But first of all, Doc, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, well thank you very much, Alex. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, and I appreciate the, the uh, young man comment for the radio listeners. I've got more gray <laughs> than I do my natural brown. So uh, <laughs> too kind, but uh, no, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. So um, as a way of introduction, so i am uh, been in Macon for two decades. Uh, I was a private practice uh, ear, nose and throat surgeon for the majority of that, and then became passionate about uh, healthcare and healthcare delivery and made the move over to healthcare administration as the chief clinical officer last year, just in time for the worst pandemic that we've seen in a generation. And so uh, for much of my tenure in this role, it's been about the COVID response and trying to mitigate that pandemic as well as delivery of kind of normal healthcare, as you talked about. And so um, that, that's been a huge part of what I've been doing for the last 18 months is, is our, our response to the pandemic and then our uh, attempts to try to continue delivery of normal, usual health care. And, and, you know, one of the things that we talk about is the, is the, second, the second pandemic, and that's the pandemic of deferred health care. Right. So if people don't come in and get their screening colonoscopies or their mammograms or their pap smears, you know, are we going to see an uptick in, 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 in illness uh, and worsening of illness because we haven't been getting health care? So, so those are the sorts of things that, that, that you know, keep me up at night and, and, and that we worry about from a health care delivery standpoint. Thank you very much. Sir. You know, talking about people taking care of themselves, I think, you know, it's not common information and then a lot of people don't realize that there are several approaches that one can take as it relates to being seen or being heard or being treated or being informed as it relates to certain problems that one may may have as it relates to healthcare. So kind of walk us through, if you would, the different approaches to uh access in healthcare. Sure. So, you know, first off is just the general philosophy of medicine is that your access to healthcare begins with your primary care physician. And that's what it means, primary, right? That's your primary doctor. And that can be in the form of an internal medicine doctor, that could be a family medicine doctor, that for uh, women that can be your OBGYN. Um, and that, uh, that primary care physician uh, should be your gateway, if you will, to healthcare. Now, as 
Um, healthcare has matured as we've seen some early disruption of healthcare and the delivery of healthcare. That's taken on a slightly different role. And so we've seen the, we call it the consumerism uh, of healthcare. And so you have minute clinics and pharmacies, you have Walmart delivering primary care. Um, we're seeing uh, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs, physician, we call them APPs or physician extenders, who may be that first touch point that you have with primary care. Um, and then you have uh, virtual in that space. And so we have um, lots of different virtual offerings that are beginning to come out. Some insurance companies are offering virtual uh, visits uh, and we are offering virtual visits, but there's there that that's the ideal way that one would enter into the healthcare space is through a primary care physician. And so uh, Atrium Health Navison is passionate about developing primary care in Central Georgia, and we are working to expand primary care and to invest in primary care. But yes, again, we feel like this is the, the best way for people to access health care and, and to get to the right place at the right time to receive the health care they need. Yeah, that's outstanding. You, you talk a little bit. I, I think too many people don't realize and understand how virtual visits, you know, work. And, mm -hmm. and, they, and I'm going to use work in two, two ways, how they work and do they work. Sure. So talk a little bit, walk through uh, the virtual visits phenomenon for us. Sure. So, so, you know, virtual means that electronically, much like we're doing right here through Zoom, you can connect with a healthcare provider. And, you know, we were on track, most experts thought we were on track for five to 10 years um, back in, in, in 2020 to, to get to where virtual had an impact on the delivery of healthcare. And the COVID pandemic compressed that. It accelerated our need to adopt virtual into just a matter of weeks. Um, and so it was a huge disruptive force um, in, in healthcare. And, and I will just say that we recognize that as a health system. So Navison Health, when we partnered with Atrium Health, one of the, the underpinnings of that, of that decision was a robust um, virtual platform that they had developed already uh, in their market, and we were able to leverage that very quickly and bring into our market uh, for the benefit of our patients. But, but to your question, what virtual is, is the ability to connect with a provider through your phone or through your computer or potentially um, even through like a portal somewhere, like a centralized portal. And so, and it can be uh, as basic as just, uh, you know, like questions that would screen you, which we call a chat bot, which might be, which we have um, through the Atrium Health Navison intranet page. And you can go and you can put in your symptoms and it would tell you, you know, wow. you need to check in with your primary care doctor or you need to go to urgent care, or it would say those symptoms are concerning you either need to call 911 or go to the emergency room. So that can be very rudimentary and very basic. So it'd okay, be like a let, simple. Let me interrupt you, Doc, because I think that's important. And I don't want that point to be missed. And I tell you why I said that. Because as we speak, you know, I just notice a little, you know, I, I, I'm gonna be hands-on and practical here. Just like a little pain in my back, you know, and then it kind of started last night. And of course I got a primary physician internist and all that. But I want to draw that up as a real live scenario. So what I could do, you know, virtually, and I didn't know that it was kind of like immediately and generally accessible. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. uh, are you saying that a, a person, you know, who has a problem can go to a resource and type in and put in you know, the symptoms, and I, I'm, I'm not minimizing the need to see your primary care, of but course. I'm just saying as an alternative and as a complement or supplement to trying to determine, because look, I know that, that early detection and treatment are extremely important. I had two people in my family that passed from uh, 
colon cancer, you know, which I think probably could have been prevented. So I just want to make sure that, you know, the listening and viewing public really understand and appreciate what you're saying as it relates to being able to access that. Because we still got people, unfortunately, who who don't have insurance and who don't realize, and I want you to talk about that a minute, that there are resources out there for individuals, even though you might not have this heavy insurance coverage, but there are, are, are still resources to access health care. So talk a little bit about those resources. But first, if you would, talk about, uh, help me out as it relates to the, the availability of virtual care by just going to a resource. Sure. So so the first and most basic is, is just like a symptom screener for COVID, which would just kind of direct you where you need to go. It doesn't really have treatment. It just kind of says, hey, you know, this is something you can check with your primary care doctor about, or your symptoms sound like you need to go to urgent care, or, you know, you need to seek immediate attention now. Um, not really treatment there. That's just the, the symptom screener, right? And then the next level, which is, um, we call it a direct-to-consumer, but basically what it is, is you can go in and you can click on this uh, on our homepage, on the Atrium Health Navison homepage, um, the, and, and get a visit right then. And um, it's just a flat rate, and you um, can, can you know, pay for the flat rate and get seen by a provider who can help you with your symptoms. And if it's something very basic, um, like uh, sinus infection or, um, you know, a common cold, symptoms that fit with a cold or, you know, something, a urinary tract infection, something basic that's very simple, you may be able to get a prescription and you may be able to get that wow. treated immediately. Uh, so to your point, you know, you have some back pain, they would be able to say, you know, are you having trouble moving your foot? Are you having trouble with your bowel or your bladder? And, you know, screen you to make sure you don't have anything terrible. And like to your point about your family with colon cancer, if you were to say, well, yeah, I'm having blood in my stool and I've been having all these other symptoms, then that, end of, that, that provider could say to you, you know, Mr. Habersham, we think this is something really concerning and we want to help you go ahead and make an appointment and they can help you get an appointment with the appropriate person might be a primary care physician. If it's something obvious, it might be with a urologist or a specialist, but they can help you make those wow. connections, right? Um, alternatively, if you were to call in and say, hey, you know what, I, uh, I broke my leg and it's kind of hanging funny, they're not going to be able to manage that, obviously, right? <laughs> they're going to say, you know, you need to go on to, you know, the appropriate location and it might be, you know, urgent care or it might be to the emergency room. Uh, so there obviously is a limit to what you can do through, you know, some type of telephonic or computer portal. Uh, but you know, again, for some basic, you know, kind of the most common things, right? Um, and 75% and, and of primary or urgent care visits have something to do with ear, nose and throat, because that's what I did. And they're the cold, sinusitis, ear infection, right? And a lot of those you might be able to get managed uh, you know, through a uh, some type of a virtual visit, um, and then and then the the next level beyond that is let's say you have a primary care physician. Many of our, our providers through the physician group and many of the primary care providers here in Central Georgia have a virtual offering as well, so that you might be able to call your primary care physician and say, "Hey, you know, Doctor Duke, I I need to see you." and you can set up a virtual visit, right? And then they can file your insurance if you have insurance, or they may be able to negotiate a cash price with you and say, hey, look, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll set up a 30 minute consultation by phone, saves you the hassle of having to drive the risks of exposure if you're concerned about exposure to COVID. Um, and so that's an offering again, through our physician group and our primary care uh, network, you, you can have those sorts of offerings. And then you get on into the more, uh, robust uh, and expanded virtual offerings, which, uh, you know, we're really excited about. We can talk a little bit more about, but, but to your question, um, we, we think that through the symptom screener and this direct to consumer where you can go in and get, you know, get a new visit, you know, just, a, or a connection with your primary care physician, that that will cover, you know, many of the complaints that bring people 
uh, to urgent cares and emergency rooms at a time when, you know, as you said in your introduction, we're really facing some, some just unbelievable capacity challenges um, right now. Yeah, and that's an, and I think that's important because a lot of people uh, mistakenly think that if they have a cold, they need to go to the emergency room. And, you know, and then I know that emergency rooms are bombarded with people who have symptoms and who do need treatment, but then there are alternatives to going to the emergency room and having to sit and wait. And I think that those virtual visits would be a, a mechanism to to kind of kind of address that. Would you agree? I would definitely agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. I mean, the way we we think about it is we our emergency room needs to be there in a perfect scenario, right? And I understand access to healthcare and those, and I'm, I don't discount that at all. But in a, in a perfect world, you go to the emergency room where you have you know, a serious acute medical condition where you need, you know, life-saving or stabilizing or a care for something that really does, can't be taken care of anywhere else, right? Urgent cares ought to be for those patients in ideally in a perfect world who aren't so sick they need to be in an emergency room, but need care immediately, cuts, broken, you know, something broken easily that can be can mended or splinted um, or, you know, uh, a, a, an illness that can be treated, right? Um, and then can go home. And then, you know, virtual and primary care can handle everything else is in, in a perfect world. Um, and then what we're trying hard to do as a healthcare system is to, to, to provide enough resources to make that a reality as much as we can. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much for that. And then talk about um, hospital capacity. I think that and we all know that it's being driven by uh, COVID. Let's talk a little bit, if you would, about COVID. Uh, let's talk about uh, the Delta variant to the extent that we can. And let's talk about what people should do and, 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 and address, if you would, some of the hesitancy. You know, I mean, I'm vaccinated. Matter of fact, I told somebody the other day that I'm going to be first in line for the booster, you know, because mm -hmm. I believe in it and um, I believe the science and uh, it's important to me, you know, I'm over, I'm, I'm over 15. So I might. <laughs> 12, 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm over 12. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so talk a little bit about the COVID the Delta variant, uh, the hesitancy, and the availability uh, uh, as a relation to how to approach, you know, this very serious. And then it, what what bothers me, I was beginning to feel better, frankly, sure. yeah. after having been vaccinated and, you know, after, uh, after having seen that the vaccinated really worked. And after having learned that the people who are now getting sick, you know, for the most part, have not been vaccinated. So let's just talk a little bit uh, based on your experience and expertise and history about COVID, where we are, what we need to do, the hesitancy, the safety, and what have you. Sure. So, so first, let, let's talk just, you know, very broadly about the COVID. Um, virus. And so the first thing is, is that the COVID virus is a, is a very serious virus that um, exploits the uh, lungs and cardiovascular system of people who have vulnerability. And so it creates pneumonia and, and stress on the heart and lungs. And if you are someone who has uh, lung problems, or cardiovascular problems, you're at a much greater risk of, of having complications from it. And so what we see is that, you know, people try to initially to relate it to the flu, uh, but what we saw was just terrible pneumonias and people winding up on ventilators uh, and in, uh, in the ICU 
and and then people die from it. You know, a lot of people die from it, and and so very quickly, what you know, what's insidious about this this horrible virus is it exploits our healthcare disparities, and so what we're seeing is you know it's hitting people that we have failed as a healthcare system to address their medical needs, right? So our people who have heart failure, COPD, hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, right? They're the people at greatest risk. And then when you look at the demographics of that, it's unfairly, you know, minorities, blacks, you know, they are unfairly targeted by this virus. And so what it has done for us as a healthcare system and those of us in administration of, of, of healthcare is to say, look, you know, we've been We've not been adequate at what we've been trying to do to meet the healthcare disparities in our community, and COVID is wiping them out. And it's it's just it's just the most it, it's truly the most challenging thing for us as administrators is to is to see this and to recognize that that our efforts have not been adequate to level the playing field across the demographics. And so that's the, that's that's really for me what what it's done and so it has it has challenged us to begin to have real honest conversations and to 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 meet with people like like you and and, and with other leaders in communities and say you know what do we need to do as a healthcare system to address the needs of our community to get to people to address their heart disease and their lung disease and their diabetes and, and get rid of those disparities so that we can remove those vulnerabilities for the next wave, right? And right. so so that's, to me, when I think about COVID, you can't think about COVID without thinking in terms of that and thinking in terms of, you know, disparities in your community, socioeconomic disparity, you know, access to disparities. Those are all fueling this this horrible disease so so that's the that's that's the if you will that's the landscape that we find ourselves in then then what happens is that we quickly developed vaccine and our experts tell us that we need to get to what's called herd immunity we need to get to somewhere approaching 80 percent of people with antibodies against covid for the fire to go out Right, we have a fire burning. And we got to get it out. How do we do that? You know, if you if you want to use that metaphor, we got to get control of it. And the way to get control of it is to get antibodies. Now, unfortunately, um, despite it being you know rigorously tested, going through the FDA process, um, and and having multiple you know, clinical trials that show safety and efficacy, it was politicized, and huh. people felt like. You know, and, and I've heard, um, you know, all the arguments and, and I, 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 I understand that. And I understand that, you know, if you look in, in our history, way back in our history, there have been some things that have occurred in healthcare and the development of medicines and the development of what we know uh, that, are, that are abhorrent in the way that we've done that. Uh, but in this circumstance, uh, science has shown us with, with millions of people who've received vaccine that it's safe and it's effective. And with the original variants of COVID, right? Um, it was uh, the, the two mRNA, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, were greater than 90% effective at preventing infection uh, and 100% effective at preventing complications. Uh, and then Johnson & Johnson, the single dose, uh, which is a slightly different type of vaccine, uh, was about um, you know, 60 to 70 percent effective in preventing infection, but but approach that that same you know 100 percent effect of preventing serious complications, ventilator, ICU stay, death. Right. Well, uh, come on, what's happened is when the virus, when the fire keeps burning, if you will, when the virus keeps replicating in our community, um, small breaks in the in the DNA and the RNA can occur. And those breaks create new variants. And so nature has a way of overcoming. If you've ever watched Jurassic Park, they talk about that. Nature has a way of overcoming. And so what happened is new variants emerge. So as long as we leave this fire burning, right, as long as it's still replicating in our community, there's pressure to develop new variants that can get around the vaccine. And so what emerged is what's called the Delta variant, right? So the Delta variant is 
significantly more infectious. It's as infectious as chickenpox. And so what's happening is it's replicating much quicker and the, the, the burden that people have in their nose and their nasopharynx is higher that they become infectious before they're even symptomatic. And so what we're seeing is to your point, as it was just kind of dying out, people were getting vaccinated, the mask mandates were, were working and the fire was kind of going out, this Delta variant emerged and we let our guard down, right? We took our foot off the accelerator of getting vaccines and we quit wearing our masks and this Delta variant is caught, you know, it's caught fire and it is ripping through our communities. And so we were seeing literally 20% increase in the number of hospital admissions every day, every day. And you mean 20 uh, on top of 20 on top of 20? Percent, 20%, That's right? I mean. So it was 40, then it was, you know, 48. And then it was, you know, you get it. And then it was 60. And then it was 72. Uh, and then it's, it's you know, approaching 100. Right. So I mean, it's just ripping through our communities, because it's so highly infectious. Now, the other thing is that in your people are hearing about this is the vaccine is people are getting it despite being vaccinated. So we're, we're seeing in the community, um, you know, somewhere around 20 to 15 to 20% of people who are vaccinated still seem to be susceptible and can get COVID. If we look at our number of people admitted, right, um, then we have, if we look at the people admitted, it's 10% of people have had the vaccine. If you look at the number of people in the intensive care unit, it's only 3%. And if you look at the number of people on the ventilator, it's zero. So what that tells you is that if you look at those numbers, the vaccine still prevents you from getting on a ventilator and dying, right? You may get sick, you may could get COVID again, but you're not gonna get on the ventilator and die. So if anybody's saying, well, you know, the vaccine doesn't work, I'm not gonna get it, that's incorrect. It's still, you know, the, the, uh, the, the quip was, you know, ventilator or vaccine, you choose, right? And, and, and I hate to be that way, but it's true. You know, I really think people need to understand that the vaccine, will keep you off the ventilator. Um, it's safe. Uh, it is under what we call an emergency use authorization, uh, which was you know, the FDA's way to say, the studies have been done, everything's gone through, but instead of dragging our feet and mulling this over for a decade, we're gonna move this through. But that is not to say there were shortcuts taken. There's not to say it's experimental. That's not to say uh, that it isn't what it needs to be, which is our lifeline to get this fire out so that we won't have an Epsilon variant and all these other variants down the road that are gonna be even more infectious or even more resistant to the vaccine. So uh, we, are, we are working diligently to try to encourage people to get the vaccine, right? Um, we were, are trying to you know, support the people who have COVID. If, they're, if they just have symptoms, we would like to keep them out of the hospital through virtual visits. Uh, we have a hospital at home program, which we can actually admit people to, to help them. We can provide oxygen, uh, again, in their home with visits from home health or paramedicine. Um, so we have alternatives to the hospital if we can. Uh, and then we're here, the lights on if you know, you're sick and you need to be admitted or you need to be on a ventilator or you need to be in the ICU. Um, and and we're, we're, we're here for that. Right, well, thank you so much for that information. Talk a little bit about testing. We got about a minute and a half left or well, a minute left, but just speak very quickly about the importance of continuing to get text, tested. Right, so, so testing remains a very important thing because what that does is it allows us to recognize when someone needs to be on quarantine, when they need to be isolated, uh, and it can help us to, um, to really to contact trace so that we can, again, that's a, a big part of uh, preventing expansion within our community. So, so, so testing is critically important and um, we we're, um, have lots of offerings or ways people can get that, but your primary care physician, again, becomes the best gateway to get to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Believe it or not, we're out of time. I want wow. to thank you for all of that valuable information. Uh, this is a call to action. I'm your host, Alex Habersham, having interviewed Dr. Sandy, Dr. Sandy Duke of uh, Atrium Health. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you so much for that important information. 
And let me tell y'all something. You know, we all have a responsibility as it relates to trying to make sure that we're in the best of health and also as it relates to trying to beat this virus so we don't have to be back on lockdown. Heed what the doctor has said and govern yourselves accordingly. This is a call to action. I'm your host, Alex Abersham. Thank you, Doc. Have a great day. Thank you.